Munish, we are live. Uh, okay, and uh, we have three minutes to go. And ये किस पे लाइव किया आपने? Icomos India के पेज पे? जी. One minute to go. Okay. This is like being in a radio station. <laughs> Rajay said, dongle abhi bhi handle nahi ho raha hai. So I'm... All right, it's time. Yep. Okay, we can start now. Yes, please, let's start. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to this uh, fourth webinar uh, session of uh, eco Fort of ICOMOS India NSC. And uh, I welcome everyone to for uh, this particular session, which is based on uh, forts of Northwest Frontier, which is the Rajasthan. And uh, this is exemplary on its own because uh, this is the place where we have a World Heritage uh, Serial nomination also for uh, hill forts of Rajasthan. And at the same time, we have uh, lots of other recognized forts by uh, state or central uh, archaeological departments and pri private forts also, unprotected forts also, and a long legend of uh, Rajasthan with the forts. Now, I would like to uh, tell you here is that uh, Rajasthan is, uh, again, it's, it's a place which has its prehistoric uh, history and uh, every uh, century it has played its vital role uh, in the socio-economic and socio-political scenarios of Indian subcontinent. 
Uh, well, uh, today we have uh, with us uh, in this particular session, uh, Dr. Rima Huja. She is a renowned historian and archeologist. We have uh, Dr. Shikha Jain, uh, conservation architect, and uh, also uh, uh, Mr. Yash Pratap Singh, architect. Uh, he is uh, a conservation architect, fabulous person. And uh, we will start with uh, Dr. Rima Huja. She is, as I said, she is an historian, archeologist, did a lot of work on uh, the history of uh, Rajasthan. She is an author of a fabulous book called uh, History of Rajasthan. I don't know if you can see this. It's our, uh, you know, encyclopedia for us. Instead of Googling uh, anything about Rajasthan, it's better to pick up this book and uh, go through it. It's faster and more authentic information, you'll get it uh, on this. Uh, Dr. Rima Uja presently is a director at uh, JIGAD. Uh, she is also a member of advisory board for archeological trustee, Jaipur Virasat Foundation. Uh, she is a visiting professor for uh, at SPA uh, Delhi, Ahmedabad University. She, she is now uh, a vice president for ICOMAS uh, India and uh, of course, other than this book, she had authored several other uh, books. And I don't take much time uh, uh, because she, she has a long, long uh, introduction. And uh, most of you know her uh, otherwise also. So uh, I'm very eager to now uh, uh, want to uh, listen to Dr. Rima Uja and would like to welcome uh, uh, Dr. Rima Uja, uh, please. Uh, now the floor is yours. Dr. Imaojo. Uh, I think she's been to... disconnected. Yeah, she's been disconnected. So we'll just wait for a minute okay. for her to reconnect. Fair enough. So then I'll take a few more minutes till we uh, she gets connected, and uh, I'll talk about slightly about uh, this whole initiative. It's a fabulous initiative which is going on uh, on uh, hill forts uh, or on the fortifications of all over India. And uh, I think uh, this particular uh, subject on its own has a great potential because uh, not only what we have as a uh, few listed forts, whether under several state archeologies or uh, central archeology, span but at the same time, we have lots of other fortifications, forts, uh, what we call guard gadis, uh, which are uh, lesser known, still either they are uh, overlooked uh, missed by the people, wilderness, or been underestimated somehow. But fortification is not just typical individual forts, but they always formulate a kind of a network. And uh, this uh, uh, as defense of any particular territory actually remains even today also when we are talking about, you know, sorts of cyber war and things like that. But to protect the territory, this kind of a linkages between the different um, uh, strongholds still remains. Uh, furthermore, I think uh, India in, in a matter is even more peculiar, uh, uh, especially uh, with the fortifications because we are blessed with uh, a vast territorial uh, Diversity, I would rather say, geographical diversity. We are from the hills up to 5,000 feet, uh, meters above the sea level. We have forts and we have forts right at the sea. So uh, we have forts in the jungles, we have forts uh, on the plains, we have forts on the hills. And uh, this kind of a diversity of geography actually uh, is something which is very much unique to our country, and I think uh, a proper compilation of such kind of uh, 
system uh, of fortification definitely needs attention and uh, i'm sure nsc uh, ecofort of icomos india is uh, paying its attention to this particular aspect and uh, uh, with its uh, you know very concentrated efforts i hope to see more and more work coming up in the uh, coming future well uh, we are not yet able to connect uh, Pima Huja the... is back online yes that's great that's great so uh, dr rima huja uh, would like to give the floor to you now and uh, we are very eager to listen to you no thank you all very much uh, i'm not so sure i want to be speaking after so many brave last couple of days where i was so impressed by the quality of the work take myself off the screen now but having committed i am going to make the presentation as soon as i can screen can you hear me yeah uh, do you want uh, we run your presentation on another system So I want to put myself off the screen now, but having committed, I am going to make the presentation as soon as I can. Okay, I start, and if you would like to take my face off the. You can see. Let's just stay with this. Let me just start talking, and if uh, you might want to just uh, take my face off for now, and also change when you think there's there. I felt that I needed to give a slightly different perspective to what uh, we have had already, because not being a conscientious or a military historian, my own uh, particular field relates to history. And I felt it pretty useful to look at the whole background that comes with it. Uh, it's a bit disconcerting to speak to nobody. Have you lost me again? We can easily hear you now. Okay. Um, let's go next. Let's see who's controlling this. We go on to the next one, please. When we talk of Rajasthan, you already have so much are being talked about. The palaces are being talked about, and I thought, what is it I could do different? that could bring something new to the tissues and uh, raise issues that we will not normally think about when you are mapping your documenting your fort or taking measurements or something like that uh, we can go to the next image this is to keep keep uh, going like talk next image please so that's the entrance to Sivana. There's something of Malbrek. I'm not actually going to be talking about the slides you're seeing just now. So this is more by way of an appetite wetter. My concern is to take us through a whole time zone where the very early fortifications that we have in historical times are probably going all the way back to Harappan sites and contemporary sites. So let's have a couple of more slides, please. I'm not sure how we are coordinating this, but I think it's working very smoothly. Thank you for the administrators who are doing this. Right, we have Gagron. Next, please. And the next. 
So these images are more by way of introducing aspects to the of different four across Rajasthan. This is a famous Jaldurg or the water uh, fort of Gagaron, which is one of the six heritage, uh, one, one of the six which is World Heritage Site that Shikhaji will be talking about in a few minutes after me. Next, please. Uh, all the things that we do study, the gates, the access, the whether they are arched, whether they are cobbled. Next. Uh, I think this is where, as we go through the next couple, so this is you go down to the water, something that one often talk about, this comes within areas to defend during times of war because you need your water, but you also have water sources on top of the uh, on top of the fort itself. Next, please. Next, please. The pretty picture just to set the stage for what I'm not going to be saying. Next, please. Again, one of the sites that will be talked about uh, after my presentation. Next, please. All right. Uh, the what I do want to now come back to is Rajasthan, which is rough size and shape of France. It's had several kingdoms over the centuries. Uh, Jaipur, where I'm sitting now, is the capital of what used to be a kingdom that was the size of Switzerland when uh, it merged with India. So very obviously, we've had over to 21 states kingdoms in 1947. So over the years, it's had cities, hill forts, towns, villages, lots of small settlements which were in the plains, in the desert, on hills, in valleys. Water has always been an issue in Rajasthan, so the terrain is difficult, but uh, it's also the most populated desert in the world. So it's had caravans coming through, it's had people coming through, very obviously trade, and people have been there. And we've had a lot of human-made wells, reservoirs, step wells, water bodies, agricultural tanks. Yes, we have agriculture. We even grow rice, uh, which was grown even in the third, not the third, third millennial BCE. Obviously, crafts, industries, all of them need water, as do shrines. So water is an important part of our cultural landscape. And water has been very crucial to the location of forts, but also to the life within forts. Next, please. Uh, and then next. The geography of Rajasthan will also be using uh, a map later on. So just basically just to say what you can see very much on your screen. The oil is extremely dry and has been for the last several thousand years. Uh, we have what is in the Banas area has been had more rainfall, and uh, the Chittor southeast that area has had a different. So the geography has played its part in in the way the folks are going to be uh, next. One of the minor forts near Jaisalmer. This is one which in the local way they call Mongar. And I think it also fits in with the way that Yash is going to talk about Sarvar. So the fact that they are large forts, but they are also smaller forts. They are capitals, they are Tikanas, they are garrison forts. This is the whole range. And very, next please. With this, we also have lines of fortification. But before that, water is another way how uh, terrain, you know, you, it was also used for, for purposes, but not all that much, but it was also part of the supply lines. I think I will now go on to the archaeological site, a couple of them, won't bore you too much with it, 
so i can apology forever next so fortification or its absence when we come to archaeology we find that in the extreme north, north or northwest of rajasthan we have sites along the river called ghaggar now which is part of the hakra coming through from haryana going is now the pakistan area and so there are harappan sites there where they very obviously like with kalibanga they have a fortification wall they have gates but when you come to some other sites this one is gilon what you see on your screen which is an ahar culture site the same period roughly third millennium see as uh, mohenjodaro harappa kalibanga we find places to store uh, food granaries but we don't seem there are gates but we don't really know all that much about fortifications in this part of a uh, history or this period of our uh, life however knowing that later we have city gates and all one assumes that the bigger sites would have had some form of protection some form of fortification or if not fortification again my earlier word line of protection we don't know that much about moats which we do in historical times uh very early towns which are the next slide will also cover that period so roughly the 3rd century bce to 3rd century ce or if you're like me and insist on in saying common era to whom so ad this is from a site called nagri it's on the foothills of chittor and there is a period this 3rd century bce to 3rd century ce where we we have excavated sites from rajasthan i'll name a few there will be names that you know of and you you probably visited but otherwise you can easily google them so berat which is viratnagar and there's a buddhist uh, stupa there site the very well logical survey put it is tambar from where the lakes uh, the sol come which through history was very important there is a site called rang mahal which is a, a harappan but then a post harappan site with fortifications with houses that go up to uh, the site of raid and karkot nagar or nagar excavated we can go back one more please just stay with the uh, uh, earlier one and then nagri let's back to this one yeah this one now these are the excavated sites about which we have some evidence some excavation which talks of we know very little but if you look and look at the blocks you can see why this is called a hathi bara a people always said oh this is when akbar came to invade chittor he put his elephants here well friends this goes back 3rd century uh, it is a stone wall blocks put together without lime mortar and this is a form of enclosing a religious structure so there are all these kinds of ways of wall walling in walling out protecting now interestingly from nagri i want to link it to something else and so nagri is at ground level it's below chittor when i was doing that history of mine i'm so glad my my cut out at the period where munish was embarrassing me by giving a you know a little brief cv of mine but that history of rajasthan i used to wonder at that point what happens with these very early capitals the names i've just mentioned bera today nagri because soon after you find sites which are these forts which are on hills and when we don't have hills they are surrounded by moats i used to wonder what sort of protect had what is interesting is i can't answer what was happening there but i hope somebody will take it up out of our uh, uh, listeners today but there is a grammatic there's a reference in early grammar in patanjali's grammar to when the yavans or the greeks invaded saket and when the yavans invaded nagri so that means this is a site that gets invaded this is a site that withholds a siege important site and we know so little about it but that's not from want of trying we just need more word to substantiate what is going on so as we've been hearing in our predictions Uh, of this series most of these forts have physical evidence or literary re references or oral traditions we can go to the next now please which talk of earlier forts and fortifications on sites that become later forts what you are seeing on your screen now amer so amber 
part of the place gets built in the 16th century. But we hear that much earlier in the 10th century, when the Kachwahas take this area over, there is already some sort of a structure. And what you're seeing to the right of your screen, the tower, is from Jagar. And the Chilka Tola, that area, it goes back in kind of uh, not quite mythological, but early historical times. So this reference is there. One of the other forts that Shikha will talk about, Voltage, has a reference to a fort there, which was built by King Ashok's grandson. Samprati apparently got the western half of the Mauryan kingdom, and he had a fort there. Now, as a kid, when I went up there, uh, Kumbhalgarh is impressive. I was looking to see evidences of Mauryan period fort. Of course, I don't find them. But I also realized that like at Rajgriha and all these places that we hear, not all early forts would look the way the forts on your screen look like now. Let's go to the next image while I talk, please. And so we have to look at, uh, not at these kind of these merlons and loopholes for protection, which are very much much something that comes in 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th century, but at earlier ways of protection, which would also mean using nature much more. So it will just be a narrow pass between structures, which has been infilled. Um, uh, next, please, as I keep my babbling going. So let me just go back and, and I'll come to this in a minute. Uh, just go back and we'll keep the Merlons as, as I told. In, in the earlier forts, yeah, thanks. We have questions about people saying, what are the layers? What are the levels? You yourself can see when we go through some of the images that almost everything is added on. And the question about when were some of these forts built? Now, usually we don't have names of architects given but sometimes we strike lucky. So in Mewar, in the 14th century, 1480s thereabouts, the local ruler then, Mewar ruler, very, um, he built 32 out of the 82 forts of Mewar. And we know the names of several of his architects from inscription, one in particular a translation of Mandan, building architecture and conservation architecture would have read the Raj Vallabh Mandan talking of thing. So Mandan, son of Shetra, uh, designed the fort of Kumbhalgar, the, fo the form you see now, but a later edition. He also designed, or in some cases, redesigned early Mewar forts, which include Basangar and Achalgar. And he also did some, so we see examples where new buildings come up on old forts. Again, not because Rajan is forts and remembered history connected with forts. It's something I've grown up with. Uh, now time to go on to the next uh, couple of slides, the Merlon and the Jehud, please. So I just grew up knowing all this, focusing on forts. Thinking when you say fort, I think fort, very often the very romantic and not so romantic, forts, the battles around forts, the besiegements, um, things that goose make you stand on edge when you hear those stories. Uh, the fact that there is always water sources on top of forts. Next, please, as we talk. Please. So, this I've never actually thought that much. Now from this Merlon, if you look towards the uh, rear of the lower picture, you will see another uh, uh, in the background. So from Amir, from uh, uh, from Jair, from any fort that we will now be looking at, you will see a lot of fortification walls, you will see the guard posts, you will see all of them. This is like a personal thing of how something that is in front of you wasn't seen. So I looked at the defenses. I would talk about them. I would show them off to people standing on top of the I would point and say, ah, uh, this place. But they seemed chill. They seemed away from the fort. They are part of it. They are part of the larger network. And they are part of the network of smaller or ancillary forts and of the watchtowers. So let us now look at the 18th century.
the map of Sarapur. Can we have the next uh, page, please? And I'd like to thank the Manada Savai Mansingh Second Museum um, and the Trust for this, because this is displayed all, it's been published in books. What you see, uh, the, the larger uh, uh, built up of Jaipur, or Savai Jaipur, this is a map, more or less contemporary to uh, Savai Jaising the second. And what the reason I put it on, uh, and please go on to Facebook Live later and look at it or whatever you'd like to, is to draw attention to what are some of the forts around it. Read about Jaigarh and Amagarh or Ambagarh as it then was, and Nahargarh as part of the defensive uh, network that wasn't really needed by the 18th century, but it's there for all and it's being used. But that is to Towards the, towards the north of the city. Uh, the, there's a seminar paper I did for it, so I'm interested in direction. But if you look at the plain beyond the hills, pinky hills, find little hillocks. One of them is Moti Dungri, which was built by Singh II, the first, uh, the, the younger, one of the younger sons of uh, Savai Jai Singh. He became a ruler of Jaipur. See what looks like a beautiful uh, charbagh is actually Sanganer. So we are part of not Sanganer so much, which is the little by itself, but the other little ones you will see Hathroi were the upper part of your picture. All of these are part of the, to hear anything. Is, is it is it my speaking? Somebody please tell me. Um, I don't know what I can do. I keep talking. So uh, uh, Rima ji, is, is there a uh, voice coming behind you? Anything happening at the back of you? Yes, I had echoing. it on Facebook Live. I'm putting it off. I had, yeah, my, yeah, I had yeah. your mic going. Now, is it okay now? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great, great. So while you're on Jaipur, please look at these some of these very thin lines, which are protective forts going up from Jaipur towards Nahargarh, going up from Jaipur airport towards Jagar. Now with this in mind, let's go to the next image, please. And I'm taking you away from Rajasthan. And I'm drawing attention. I'm also at this point personally saying thank you as a historian as I am today to all my colleagues leagues, all of you who are around, and particularly to SC, Fort people, Ico Fort people, uh, like we had the fellowship, the ring, I'm going to say the fellowship of international scholarship, because a visit to Korea is what opened my eyes to the fortifications of the hills in a different way to the way I was taking it. The bit I talked about earlier gets connected here. Uh, so I'm talking of, uh, and, and thank Thank you for this. Uh, because Bukhan San Song, the capital then was Hanyang, which is the modern day Seoul. And this was, let's take the next one, a little clearer. Uh, but I'm thinking the, the, the source is here that my the internet connection is unstable. If you can still hear me, next please. Uh, this fortress within the hills is very of a different piece of regions protection system. So Korea developed its own defense system of using the as part of an outer and an inner and an even more inner ring. So it's different to Jaipur or Rajasthan, but it makes with it while my connection in books can can i be heard can the can someone tell me that manish can you hear yeah me? yeah yeah we, we can we can okay. hear you yeah so the next next image next image next image please unless i'm doing this uh 
the orange. Thank you very much. Okay, so this is what it is. What you see in the lower ring, you can thank you. In the lower ring is towards what is now Seoul, which was the capital, Hanyang, and it's got this wall of 16 kilometers is the world heritage someday because it's a and it encloses the valley. And then here you see Bukhan here you have more of this uh, if you see the next image you will see what i'm talking about next please we have the next one thanks somewhere here it's no previous to this thanks this is a gateway and a wall this is more walls these are walking paths, more walls. So for someone who's grown up with forts, I was nine and didn't go to school or 10, didn't go to school. Uh, little bastion. But I was living in the foot uh, under Chittor Fort. I was at Chittor. I looked at the fort. I didn't see what this was saying to me. And those of you who do these studies will say what a fool I am. I admit it. Here's another uh, gap way. But as I said, this opens eyes to something quite different for me personally. And that was these other lines of fortification. Next, please. So it's the judicious use of all of these. Uh, whenever you are able to, let's go to the next image. And that, the, that for me was to look beyond the obvious. Here, what you see is modern day let's, the previous one just for a second uh, modern day Seoul the old Hanyang and the hills being the natural protection of the property. this is more than my local Pahari here my local fort uh, my local hill here so so then I realized that what I see in Rajasthan which we can come back to uh, I need to look at things in in ways different to what I have looked at them to now ask my five golden questions, the next image piece of how, when, what, where, why, all aspects that I look at, whether it's a free. And this understanding of geographical constraints helps at least a um, dumb person like me understand why a fort like Chittor could fall regularly despite the bravery of its defense. And uh, later on, the more parts of Mewar suited the guerrilla, I see a spelling mistake there, warfare taken up by Mewar and Rana Amar Singh first in the 16th century. There are constraints to a fort like Chittor, which is a standalone fort, where your ancillary forts cannot come if you've been besieged for a long time. Eight months of a siege in the 1657 year, uh, is is too much to handle where supply lines don't exist and when the local population have come and taken refuge in the fort. Equally, but fortresses in the middle of the desert, among them Tannot, the fort of Tannot was destroyed. It no longer exists. But Tannot Mata Temple is still visited. It's in uh, army controlled area, so people need passes. But called Hanumangar, there's, I thought there was an image, but I think I took it off. Jaisalmer, which you've seen, Bikaner, or uh, across the current border, like Deravar, very important forts, which go back in time. And they also rely far less on getting aid from ancillary forts and their own minor uh, members or dependent uh, feudatories and more from their specific natural terrain. Yesterday, Ashish and talked about Patan and gave a reference to Patan. Now, a uh, prince of Jaisalmer got married in Patan, and his Patan mother in law gave him the title of Uttar Bhad Kivar, the door, I mean, the ruler of Jaisalmer or then Lodrava was the gate that protected the north. So these are just aspects which get highlighted when I think of the geographical space around specific forts. Uh, next. So 
this is actually when we look at the connected aspects of aid and travel routes, they are coming into these ports from across Rajasthan, from across beyond Rajasthan. Rajasthan is connected, and Shikha will have some of those uh, images, I'm sure, uh, with trade from Kabul and beyond, joining up uh, ancillary routes, the Silk Route even, uh, with uh, Kabul, Kandahar, all of that area, but on to the, the south, going towards Central India, towards the Deccan, towards Gujarat, it's not an empty area. It's one of the most active parts of, uh, of India. I think all parts of India are. It's only when you look at a map today and think in different ways. Also, one has to think about cannons and weapons and the reuse of these. And I'm not going into them. I was thinking of all the things I can't go into. So thank you, Dr. Tejas Gage, for that excellent presentation you've really given. Um, and. Uh, uh, has cannons. Jaipur had also, we had our foundry at Jaigarh, but I'm not going into it. I just want to draw attention to weapons that are used, but also the reuse of these and the refurbishment of weapons. So you see the cannon. Cannons from Gujarat are taken by the Subedar, who the ruler of uh, Marwar, Jodhpur. Singh, he brings back some of those cannons. They are there. Uh, but they, they also get reworked. And also an aspect I cannot go into, but people do, which is life in forts. Forts were much more than a place that just got attacked. You lived there. You just lived within the fort and spent their, their life with the activities of the fort. Everything, they, they, most of the larger forts had space for agriculture, they had their own dams, they had shrines, mainly temples, but in, in many cases, and mosques uh, where children played. So this is home. And one of the things we would when we talk about management is that some of these have had occupation after, since in the last 50 years, which should not be there, but it still gives it a sort of life. And how do we deal with that aspect? But since since I am in my period of time, can we go to the next, please? And I am more or less through, except to make a few more, I think. So images of sieges to the fort. Uh, this is Chittor being attacked, and the cannons there, and the tents. Um, the next, please. There's another image with this. If we can go to that. So, uh, with, uh, I think I also want to, at this point, while we are switching to the next image, talk about the fact that a lot of rulers from the Rajasthan area, India, and they picked up style, their own interpretation to them, and they also did that in the forts they built. Can we have the next image, or am I babbling on? I've moved to the next image and I can't see it. So, for example, uh, Raja Man Singh did a lot of building in different parts of India. Can we have the next? Anyone? Have I been lost? And can I be heard? Uh, Rimaji, we can hear you. I think I just again, I can see this. I can see this. Uh, the next one, please. Whenever whenever you are able to, even if you can't hear me, just go to the next. Thank you. So, the, uh, Tejas again was talking about mines the, the other day that drew my attention to this. And frankly, till then, I hadn't, I'd seen the same so often. I had thought in terms of differences between, you know, Barut and Catapult. Of course, I know the difference in theory. I don't think of it. So uh, next, please. So influences from everywhere get taken up. Now, when I talk about the rule of past, style, mobility, much more is what I'm talking about. The 16th Saman Singh, the first of eight, the kingdom is Dundar, but the capital of Amber. And we do say Amer now, but for those of you 
uh, it is Hindi. It is still got a silent Amba sound from Ambeshwar or Amba Matan. We have lots of thing on that. So it is Amber, but in writing it becomes Amir. He built forts at Salimpur in Bengal, at Manihari, at Ramgarh. Found the town Agar, which is Raj Mahal, uh, near the near uh, the in Bihar, Manpur, and the township of Bekunpur. He also built the fort of Rohtas in Bihar, uh, but he also built the Nilab fort in what is now Pakistan. And he also made lots of forts, palaces, gardens in Kashmir, Punjab, and then places. So he took his own style because something else we need to think about who travels with a ruler. He doesn't go alone. He doesn't go just with an army. He goes with somebody who's making, who's shooting the horses, who's uh, carrying water, who's carrying the food, pick up things. They bring back uh, ideas. So we need to think about this when we talk about specific forts and uh, you see, and the beautiful scene parts of Amir came from a different source and the Bangladesh that you talk about but there are people more qualified than me so i'm not going to talk about it just the next please i'm going to show a whole bunch right to say the and study fort is there so many of them and they're getting lost to us or they're falling to ruin. So there are a lot of pages after this. Allow me to speak a little more. Timangar, known as Tehangar, Tribhuvangari, Tribhuvangar, was founded by King Tehanpal in 93 uh, or thereabouts. That's his ruling period. His ancestors had been ruling the Mathura area. So they are the Yanchis. And uh, his uh, image ancestors were at Bayana near Bharatpur. The Timangar is now in the Karoli. He made this new fort 23 kilometers to the south of Bayana, but it's more than 23 who fit because it is in hills. Fort. Houses for ordinary citizens. It's got temples and gardens. It's got a market street. It's got a talk. It's got barrack, obviously. Uh, grand stables, armory, stores for food stuff, oil, fodder. Fortifications protected the entire town within its walls. The defense walls were reinforced with bastions, battlements, and watchtowers. And the two main gateways were the Jagan Prol and Surya. For people used to poll, this is not a spelling mistake. Dungarpur area, Timangar area, several parts. Different. Nobody is correct, nobody is incorrect. Next, please, should be a lot of images of Timangar. We keep going through them. Uh, Priya, you can take them at your own pace. Thank you. I don't need to speak much other than point out the ruins. And you can see the stairs. You can see what has happened. Uh, bad image, but offensive wall on the the hill itself, enclosing eight kilo, square kilometers. Next, please. Whenever you are able to, thank you. So gateways and more gateways. A lake in a distance, there, there are all kinds of stories attached to it. Move whenever you like to the next. Thanks. Uh, definitely worth documenting. And probably it's had uh, it's had its share of numbers because there's a story about this lake 
having uh, lost in the dust of the first so as to Harry Potter, that equivalent. And uh, at some point, the chain turned to gold. Uh, they can't find it. Point is, their protection is there, but there's a place falling to ruin. And I think that becomes the kind of salutary lesson that we talk about. The scale of the problem is there, it's enormous. However, I'm the ever optimist. So with collective efforts and collective will, this task of documentation, of conservation, management, of sharing of information and sharing the inside forts and the secrets of our forts and fortifications with the world at large and own people around the area, local people, and of course, the continued analysis and study of this part of our heritage will undoubtedly happen. Thank you very much for giving me this uh, space to speak. Um, start my video, I think, by this point. Yeah, thank you, Rimaji. It's a fabulous, uh, though we uh, can understand the technology issues, some limitations in terms of signal or uh, network issues. Uh, we do got yeah, we do have a uh, few questions, including myself wants to ask you something, but we'll keep the question answer session at the end of uh, the present, all, after all the three presentations. And uh, yes, please, now, uh, uh, and, uh, now uh, I would like to go with the next presentation, which is by Dr. Shikha Jain. And uh, I will be happy to introduce her as one of my colleagues. And uh, she is uh, vice president of uh, International Scientific Committee for ECOFORT, uh, which is uh, a subsidiary to uh, ICOMOS International. And they are looking into the various aspects of um, fort and its uh, fort architecture throughout the globe. And uh, uh, Shikha Jain is very much part of uh, one of the key uh, drafting members of Ecofort Charter, which we are expecting to be uh, adopted in the coming assembly. Uh, she is uh, the first coordinator for NSC uh, Forts uh, of ICOMOS India. And uh, after that, she is one of the mentors of the group and uh, still continuing as a very active member and mentor. Uh, she is uh, author and co-author of several publications uh, in the related to fortifications and uh, architectural conservation. She has co-edited the book called uh, Conserving For Fortified Heritage by Cambridge uh, Scholar Publishing in 2016 it is a, it was a fabulous publication uh, there was a international uh, conference which has uh, happened in delhi at that time and it was subsequent to that this publication came up uh, she is working as a uh, one of the founders of an organization called drona and uh, she is working on several conservation projects uh, with getty foundation world monument funds and several state and international governments. Uh, I would also like to uh, mention here that she is the author of uh, Hill Forts of Rajasthan, the nomination which uh, uh, got inscribed on the World Heritage List, the six Hill Forts uh, we are all proud of. And uh, it was fun working with it was really a, a while we were working on that particular nomination. And uh, she is also part of advisory committee to World Heritage uh, as a, a member secretary to the government of India and uh, participated in several uh, World Heritage committees. She has uh, represented India in those ones. She is also a consultant and advisor to various state governments uh, and uh, also uh, governments of Singapore, Malaysia, UAE, Myanmar, and also UNESCO, Jakarta, Myanmar, and New Delhi. Uh, I would uh, rather now welcome Shikha now, and she is going to talk about the six hill forts uh, of uh, Rajasthan, the nomination, and it was uh, you know, uh, one of the earliest uh, serial nominations in the country, which has opened up a vast spectrum of uh, 
opportunities to include many more similar sites in the different nominations. Over to you, Shika. Thank you, Manish, uh, for that uh, elaborate introduction. <laughs> I feel so embarrassed <laughs> you went on and on. Um, first of all, I want to check that I'm heard properly because I think today we are having some technical issues with the webinar. So I was sorry that I was, couldn't uh, you know, really hear Dr. Reema Huja's presentation clearly. So am I audible clearly? Yes, 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 very much. Yep. Okay. Then I think uh, what I'm going to do is I will switch off my video and share the presentation because without the video, I think it's a better sound. It's better, yes. Yeah, so I'm sharing the presentation now. Just let me know if it is uh, visible. It's, it's loading. Yeah, it's there. Okay, let me get to the beginning, yeah. Okay, can you see it on the slideshow now? Very perfect, Shika. All, all yeah. well. Thanks, Manish. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'll start immediately with the, you know, my presentation on the hill forts of Rajasthan. And I start at the beginning, uh, which is, you know, when we are celebrating the inscription in 2013, it was really, you know, a great achievement for us, we felt, because as you all know that UNESCO inscriptions are a very rigorous process, and I have great um, respect for that process, and when one learns a lot during the process, you know, on, on what really needs to be world heritage, what is the outstanding universal value, how you select attributes, because often, uh, you know, we are very closely associated with our heritage sites and we feel that it is worth listing on World Heritage, but really to select and finalize on what goes on the list and why it is so competitive, how does the site qualify, it is very important and especially for the hill forts of Rajasthan, because there are so many forts, you know, so just that selection itself was uh, uh, one uh, long process that I want to share with you. And of course, I mean, this it got inscribed in 2013, but we started the dossier much earlier. We filed it in 2011. There were some issues raised. And then again, it was processed in 2012 and finally got inscribed in 2013. And I'm glad today that, you know, on this panel, we have Dr. Reema Huja, who was, you know, like the her, her book on history and her guidance throughout was like the backbone for this entire nomination dossier, you know, to, to define the physical uh, boundaries of each, uh, to look at the diverse physiography and select the forts and also the cultural diversity. So it was really great to have her as the advisor for this uh, nomination. Also, uh, you know, Manish Pandit, who just came at the last leg of the nomination and helped us file in the last uh, fort of Jaisalmer in the, in the next round. And of course, later on, I mean, we have Yash as a, you know, our youngest uh, speaker, but uh, now Yash has been working with me on the Chittorgarh Fort, you know, one particular interpretation center or museum that we did. So I'm really happy today that on the panel, we have all these, uh, you know, my sort of associates uh, and colleagues for this nomination on board. Um, as you can see, I mean, in 2013, this was a great achievement. The site got inscribed on criteria two and three. For people who do not know what a serial nomination is, it is basically when you inscribe a series of sites as a single world heritage site. And that series of sites needs to tell a story about you know, a particular historical cultural group. It should be from the same period, history and culture and could narrate the history of your place. It could be a pan India nomination. It could be you know, pan Rajasthan, which is what we attempted. And the serial nomination for six hill forts of Rajasthan was the first serial nomination for any cultural heritage site in India. Until now, it remains the only serial nomination because it's very complex. And of course, there have been uh, further attempts. We've on the tentative list, we have Deccan and others. And this we will talk about in the next session on 4th July. But I'll begin my story with the hill forts of Rajasthan. So what UNESCO inscribed said within the state of Rajasthan six extensive and majestic forts together reflect the elaborate fortified seats of power of Rajput princely states that flourished between the 8th and the 18th centuries and their relative political independence so you have to note that they were in the in one state but had political independence 
the extensive fortifications up to 20 kilometers in circumference optimize various kinds of hill terrain, specifically the river at Gagron, the dense forests at Pranthambar, and the desert at Jaisalmer, and exhibit an important phase in the development of an architectural typology based on established traditional Indian principles. So there is a rec recognition of the traditional Indian food principles here. My presentation is structured in three sections. I talk about the serial nomination, how we selected the first level of forts. Then second, how we specified attributes you know, of the forts that would finally go in uh, to the nomination. And then a bit on the management framework, just you know, a few slides to show what is the management framework for these. So in, when we filed it in 2011, you know, we had initially five forts and then um, ICOMOS raised some issues because they felt that in the series, you know, five forts, they, they were not sure of one or two forts like Ranthambor and Gagron in terms of the outstanding universal value. And they were, you know, uh, they could understand that the, what the series wanted to do was really look at Rajput uh, military architecture in its with its diverse princely kingdoms, you know, because Rajput though it's the Rajasthan is one state and ha it has had several Rajput uh, princely kingdoms who have been fighting with each other. So it's not like a like one kingdom that was there, but several smaller kingdoms that were there. So so they they could understand that there is a storyline, but they wanted to further evaluate, uh, you know, uh, whether some forts are qualified. And one important Jaisalmer fort that we had not put it in the first place because the government, both the government of India and government of Rajasthan were not comfortable. It had some serious management issues and they thought we'll put it as a series in the next round after those issues are resolved. So those were the two issues. And because of this, the World Heritage Committee in 2012 asked us for a more detailed approach for the selection of the components to show that they represent the various categories of Rajput military architecture in the whole range of Rajput kingdoms. So it's not one kingdom, but it's several kingdoms and physiographical terrain of Rajasthan. Uh, if we look at the cultural zones in Rajasthan, you can see that there are nine regions, nine cultural zones, different dialects, and within these there were, you know, different kingdoms. So like Mewar was one kingdom, Marwar is another kingdom, Dundar is where the Jaipur and Amir are. So these were all separate kingdoms, and at times they also covered other areas. So this, you know, these boundaries mixed. Of course, they would also go beyond in other states, you know, with, with Gujarat and uh, Madhya Pradesh, which have also Rajput forts. Um, so, you know, to begin with, I mean, this particular area of Rajasthan state is roughly the size of the country of France, and it has more than 250 forts, which are already sort of listed by the government of Rajasthan as important forts. And of course, this does not add uh, other watch posts, smaller fortifications. So some major 250 forts were listed by Rajasthan government when they were looking at adopt a, a fort kind of a strategy. A um, few years back, but from these 250, how we worked on to the final ones that had the outstanding universal value, we first selected 54 forts. Uh, you know, you can see at the base of this pyramid, uh, inventorying significant forts of Rajasthan, 54 forts. Then we looked at what is the typical Rajput military architecture that can tell the story of Rajput fort planning adaptations to the various physiographic terrain within Rajasthan and also you know, present on significant trade routes. So we finally came to a list of 24 forts and then we had attributes that I will show you which finally led to the selection of six forts of the lot. So this is the inventory of 54 significant forts. If you see on the left side bottom, we looked at forts which were protected by the center, Archaeological Survey of India. The forts which were protected by the state department of archaeology in Rajasthan and besides that Rajasthan has a legacy you know of uh, several private forts which are doing very well with the foundations with the royal foundations like Jaipur you know the Jagar fort is there um, city palace Udaipur uh, under the Maharana of Mewar charitable foundation Mehrangarh foundation the Jodhpur fort even Nagar which is which are superb forts you know but then they are not protected, they are, you know, functioning very well and have their own international uh, recognition in some ways. So we looked at even those public and private forts, which were included in academic research or were very well known. So you can see these lists and this list of 54 forts and it's divided into the various physiographical, uh, you know, 
di diversity of Rajasthan, which I'll show you in the map later. So the, the second uh, step was looking at what are the key Rajput court planning features. And we looked at traditional texts. Dr. Reema Huja mentioned about Mandan and Rajva Lup, which he's written in 15th century on court planning, which is a very good guidance document. And of course, Mandan also based it on earlier documents like Arthashastra and Manusmriti and other Vastu texts, which uh, you know, mention about Giri Durg or the hill fort as to be the supreme kind and then others, and it could be combinations of uh, both. So I'm going to show you those, but with this understanding, it was clear that forts located on hill were supposed to be the superior mode of defense. And this was a, at a time when, you know, uh, the fighting was like very uh, rudimentary. It was, there was no gunpowder or cannons. So this is like the basic, uh, you know, defense system was controlling it from the hill itself, which was superior. And also like with other uh, defense mechanisms, like water had some associations with diseases. So, so that's how they, they said water fort is good, but this may happen. And then Giri Dorg or the hill fort is why it's supreme. That's what the traditional texts say. Um, then the second point was looking at Rajput rulers, how they built several forts. There, was two there were two purposes. One was they wanted to control their conquered kingdom, whether it was going from Mewar to Marwar, how they could extend. And secondly, to, to serve as a citadel and protect their people during war time. So, uh, this was, you know, the, when it was mentioned by earlier uh, in the first uh, webinar uh, by Dr. Pushkar Soni that how these forts served as cities themselves, though it is actually in a rural agrarian context. So you would have people living in the surrounding villages and when there is a war, then they would just come up to the fort and they would, they would be, the settlement would be there for three, four months till the war, you know, uh, was, uh, would finish. So that's why parts of a typical Rajput fort had royal quarters or palaces for the you know, ruler to stay. They had temples and sacred structures, you know, very important. Um, soldiers, quarters and houses uh, for them to live in. And defense mechanisms, of course, that is given fortifications, gates, moats, marlons and others. But they had this exclusive ground area for shelter of commoners. So that is when, you know, for three to four months, they would be sheltered in those big grounds within the forts while the war was uh, happening. And then uh, you have the water systems and granaries that are so important for the sustenance, you know, of people who are living in fort regularly and also during war when they need to store, you know, in their granaries and that's what they would live on for months. Um, so we then map these 54 forts on this particular, uh, you know, physiographical terrain map. So you can see this brown line going diagonal. It's very interesting how Rajasthan is split. This is the Aravli range, the hills in the middle, which divided diagonally into two areas. On the left is, you know, the desert. And on the right side, you have hills going down and finally, you know, towards the water bodies. So, so these are, you know, in the colors, you can see the various physiographical terrain um, and um, the forts that are mapped there. The other selection was also looking at how these forts control the kingdoms or all, were also part of the trade routes. So you can see this trade route map uh, within uh, the land routes of Rajasthan. And we selected the forts that were clan capitals controlling passes in highlands, which doubled as major trade routes uh, or points of infiltration, because they were definitely more important than the other smaller forts in the surroundings. And looking at this selection, we came up to some 25 plus forts. You can see, uh, you know, again in the same area. So we've thinned down now. And then we looked at adaptations of these forts to various physiographical terrains. So now coming back to the traditional Indian text, which says Giri Dorg, even in Giri Dorg or the hill fort, there are variations. You have the hill summit fort, you have the hill slope fort or the hill valley fort. And then of course you have hill water, forest, hill desert fort, which is what I'm going to show you and also explain the diversion. So we mapped all these, you can again see these 20 plus forts mapped and you can see the hill summit, slope, valley, all these forts, how, you know, the hill desert fort is of course in the desert area, in the uh, brown center, which is the Aravli range, dividing the state into two parts. You have the hill summit fort or the hill slope fort, 
which would be, you know, largely the hill is the defense system. Whereas towards the end, you see the blues. So you have the water fort right where the hills come down, you know, that's where you have the water areas. So just to give you an idea, I mean, the hill summit fort is, you know, the Giridur, where all fort structures are located on the plateau or the summit of the hill. And in Rajasthan, we have examples like this Chittorgarh. You can see it's right on top of the hill, a 30, 340 hectares fish-shaped hill on which you know the entire fort is located with all its structures um, uh, of palace spaces and water bodies. I'll show you again later. We have example of the Mehrangarh fort. Here you can clearly see how it's just located just, just on the summit. You know, So right on top you have, uh, and it's just uh, sheer cliff on all sides. So this is typical of a hill uh, plat uh, hill summit fort on a plateau. You have, we have other examples of Mandalgar, Shergar, uh, Jalor, and Sivana that you see out here. And um, so it was a selection from these. We had to look at which would be the best as the hill summit fort. And again, then hill slope fort, the difference here is that all the fort structures are located along the slope and hills with the royal quarters on the summit. So you have all other structures spread across the hill, but the main royal quarters of the palace spaces are right on the top because that is how they get protected. And you have a series of gates, you know, through which we, uh, the army would have to uh, pass to get to the royal uh, quarters. And this, I mean, in the traditional text, it, it is also called the Giri Parshav uh, Durg uh, in Hindi. So Kumbhalgarh is an excellent example of this. And you can see how the entire, you know, fortification goes along the slope. You have, you know, structures inside in the fort here, whereas right on top, you have the palace space. We had the Kumbha uh, palace here, Kumbha Mahal is here, which was the 14th century one. And this was a later palace built in the early 20th century. Uh, we have other examples you can see of the hill slope fort. You have Taragar in Ajmer, uh, Achilgarh in Abu and Basantgarh in Sirohi. In the hill valley fort now, all fort structures are located in the valley. So the valley becomes your, you know, heaven or the space where you sort of refu find refuge or protection from the, from any enemy who attacks. And the royal quarters are in the center of the valley. So sort of enspawned, you know, to uh, be protected and uh, taken care of in case of emergency. And this is an example of Amir Fort. So you can see, you know, Jagar is right there. The fortifications are there. The, the, uh, the city fortifications are spread all over, but the palace itself is set nicely in a valley right in the center. And we have other examples. This is, you know, a Google section of this. So you can see how, where Amir Fort is located or the palace structures here, whereas the Jagar Fort out here serving in, to protect Amir, you know, in case of attack. Uh, similarly, we have Taragar Fort in Bundi. So again, you can see set in a valley very nicely and the city palace of Depur. Again, you can see all surrounded by hills, but the city itself is set in the valley with fortifications, you know, uh, up on top of some of these hills where you would have watch points that would protect the fort, which is the, the palace itself, which is right in the center, the royal headquarters. Uh, in the hill water forts, the main uh, uh, aspect is that here now two natural defense features work together. One is the hill and the other is water. So basically these two work as defense mechanism. And this is an example of an outcrop, uh, you know, uh, on the Vindhyan hill in Gagron. This is the only place where we have uh, an outcrop of Vindhyan. Otherwise, it's all, they are all on the Aravli range. And here you see water on all sides. This is at the confluence of two rivers, uh, uh, Ahu and Sindhu, and they, they basically covered three sides of the fort and the fourth side was made into a moat. So basically it would be completely encircled with water as for defense purpose. And we have other examples where you don't have water completely enclosed, but on one side like Bhesrorgar here or Shergar in Baran, which are also fantastic forts. And then you have the hill forest forts where hill and forest become the two natural defense feature, features. And of course, everyone knows about Ranthambor National Park with its tigers, I mean, the dense forest that is there. And then in the middle of that, you have this fort right on top of this hill. So it's, it's really doubly protected first coming through the forest and then uh, all these fortifications that protect it. 
and then you have others which are balakila alwar and bayana so again depending on the nature of forest it could even be thorned uh, forest you know so the the traditional texts actually explain how the forest food can also vary it could be a dense forest it could be a thin forest with lot of thorns it could be other variation so there are three variations like this given and you can see that balakila alwar and bayana are definitely not as thick forest as the national park at ranthambore um then you have the hill desert forts where hill and desert as two natural defense features which is a very unique and rare uh, you know occurrence and especially in case of rajasthan and we have this excellent example of jaisalmer you can see this hill outcrop right in the middle of the desert on which the entire jaisalmer fort is built with all its settlement inside you know currently housing about 4000 people there in all the historic havelis and houses Uh, so this of course is uh, one of the examples one of probably the only uh, you know example that we have in rajasthan but there are others which are you know in the desert area which are more like ground forts or forts built on the plains but they are still you know you see even on the plains they would look for a slightly elevated area to place the fort and we saw this in case of uh, nagor which is a fantastic fort i mean again you look at it and one wonders why is it not in the series can we add this but again i mean this is not a rajput truly a rajput fort uh, uh, if if you look at the history and its construction and this is built on ground and also there were other attributes that i will talk about which uh, can clarify that how a singular forts could could still be nominated but they may not fit in a series and in case of nagor again we if we cut a section through the google you can see that it looks like it's a fort on the plain with all its bastions and moats here but then if you see the google section you see that it is actually on a raised area within that uh, plain area so so again i mean having it slightly at a higher point as a control was something that is uh, very important junagar is another example of a desert fort and then bhatner of course bhatner gets close to punjab so if you recall uh, mrs amita beg's presentation when she had shown bhatinda it's basically of the similar typology and here the fort is made of bricks whereas in case of um, all other forts in rajasthan they are largely made of stone the stone varies of course depending on limestone or sandstone depending on the cultural zone and the, uh, uh, the geographical zone that one is uh, looking at but you can see this bhatner itself is also a very important fort just like bhatinda and on the borders and across on the trade routes also some forts were like are really in ruins like this mandor fort which is again you know on the plains so looking at all these then we worked out you know what could be the uh, potential value in terms of use of terrain which was the uh, you know among among the hill uh, summit fort which was the best use of terrain and among you know others water fort which was the best use so that's how we sifted and select shortlisted further and you can see even other military and defense systems uh, we looked at to finalize you know what could be of higher value uh, what were the skirmishes or the battles and how many times the fort was annexed so looking at the history so this of course is the historical and military perspective but then we were looking for something beyond this for the attributes of uh, forts and one realized that while looking at forts in rajasthan you have to look at something beyond the military and defense mechanism because like i said they were actually cities in themselves they are i mean if we truly look at the terminology it is what uh, would be called a fortress or citadel but while during the british period you know that's how they were listed as forts and in india we continue to call them forts but in in the european terminology they would come come under citadel or fortresses so looking at this we finally looked at the attributes for the outstanding universal value and this was in discussion with the icomas advisory mission where we had two experts and uh, we had a consensus that in the amongst the attributes physiographical is very important where the forts are adapted to and optimize various kinds of hill terrain that we've just seen in the previous slides they have to be centers of power so the forts have strong associational values as centers of rajput power and control as centers of rajput courtly culture and patronage and as former centers of learning art and music so they had to you know also showcase this attribute 
the sacred entity uh, aspect was very important that most of these Rajput hill forts are also sacred sites uh, and they have living temples within them. And then finally, urban settlements, because this whole concept of saving, you know, your um, people from the war and how it was used as a refuge. So most forts were designed to protect the populace and not only the court and military guard. So that's why these series of uh, forts was supposed to qualify all these attributes. And if you look at the six that were finally selected, they fall, they, this is a general attribute you know, general attributes that they qualify for. But even beyond in a serial nomination, you these six forts would form, would qualify for these attributes and they form a good narrative for Rajput Valor, its culture and history, you know, um, is through centuries. Uh, but even then, each one of these needs to qualify on its own for something unique or outstanding, which is not found in the other. That's how we select you know why it's not it's only these six and it can't be a seven or it can't be a five so your serial you know your outstanding universal value for the series has to be that um you know uh, tight and in, in terms of what are the attributes and you have not left anything that is has some attributes like you know jessel may ford we thought we'll do it in the next round uh, but you know it was essential to get it in because it's one of the most important fort so Looking at this, finally, this, these are the six shortlisted fort, Chitorgar, the hill summit fort, which you can see, you know, has the kind of attributes. It's on 340 hectares of land, one of the largest forts in India. Um, this is the fish-shaped hill. You can see the property area and the uh, buffer zone marked here. And on the right side, see you see two plans. One is, you know, uh, mapping all the areas like the fort wall, bastions, the gates, uh, the palace areas, havelis, etc. And the second one shows the layering in the fort, which of course, I mean, it's like Dr. Rima who just said that most of these forts were built on later. So they could be somewhere, you know, even as old as Maurya period, but then there are no remains of that period. So it's really, you know, more, uh, most of these after seventh, eighth century that you find remains. And that's what in Chittorgar you find the earliest uh, architectural structures from that period. And they go up to early 20th century, but of course, what qualifies for outstanding universal value, maybe just a few of those, uh, you know, centuries, it doesn't need to cover all the historic phases. But looking at the fort planning, and this is one of the maps from uh, Nosov's book, but we used it as, as a panel for explaining in one uh, in the museum inside Chittorgar on what would be the fort planning. And this particular fort had six palaces, originally 84 water bodies out of which 20 are still functioning. Uh, and this one that you see out here is the Ganga Kund. This is one of the largest water body and even till today it's actually gets full and supplies water to the city downstairs, the, down below. Um, so, so, you know, so many water bodies, 11 entrance gateways, havelis, houses, gardens, so Khana, Amri memorials and temples. This shows the overall planning and the entrance itself, how it was, you know, the seven gates that were uh, written in Mandan's text and followed by Rana Kumbha on how the fort should be protected in terms of entrance. And these forts, when he was renovating the forts, he, you know, for one period, Mewar Kingdom extended in the 15th century, even to Ranthambore and other areas. And you see this kind of uh, uh, gate, gates coming up in Ranthambore and Chittor, and of course in Kumbhalgar, which he originally planned. So you can see, you know, the kind of turns that were required which are even more complicated in Ranthambore. So depending on the terrain, you could do that. And if your army is approaching, you know, these are so many barriers. And if you have an elephant or horse trying to catch up speed, then these turns is what would stop them. So, so you could not have like elephants banging into the thing with, into the gate with speed, which is what uh, was the earlier technique. And of course, they would have barbicans, the gates itself, you, to counter that also. Um, the, these uh, show the details of the fort wall. Now, in case of Chittor, it's very interesting. They have these false 
uh, sort of loopholes or you know in the merlons so you can see very interestingly designed merlons and the, these may not be the actual points some of them are just blind spaces but they confuse the uh, attacker that you know which which one is functioning or or they are all functioning so you can see again this diagram which shows um, how they would be uh, using the arrows or uh, you know at different uh, angles and uh, like I said, each fort has to have its own outstanding value besides the outstanding value of the series also. So what uh, what uh, UNESCO recognizes for Chittor is that as a former capital of the Sisodia clan and the target of three famous historical sieges, Chittorgar is strongly associated with Rajput history and folklore. Furthermore, the sheer number and variety of architectural remains of early date, ranging from the 8th to the 16th centuries, mark it as an exceptional fort in its scale and monumentality, comparable to a very few other Indian forts. So you can see most of these, the Victory Tower here, uh, that's uh, Rana Kumba's time, 15th century, and even other temples which are much older, 8th century, and other structures, that's the Kumbha Palace out there, the fortifications. And what you see out here on the right is the Fateh Prakash Palace, which was built in early 20th century, almost similar to what was also done in uh, Kumbhalgarh. So this was Maharana Fateh Singh in the early 20th and she was ma one Maharana of Mewar who also sort of built all over in, in the previous capitals of Kumbhalgarh and Chittor as well as in Udaipur. And this is his very distinct style that you see here. And this, uh, uh, Palace, I will show you again because now it's converted into a, it was functioning as a museum, but it's now a museum that also talks about these hill forts of Rajasthan and about the fort planning of Chittor itself. Um, Kumbhalgar, which was the second one to be selected, and you can see, I mean, it's one of the most magnificent forts and my, but personally my favorite, you know, it's like a fairy tale fort, the way it is stretched out across the slope. This is, um, you know, an image of the uh, fort in the evening time and it is lit up and you can see the very unique bastions it has, which is, you know, very rare to find. It is only in another fort uh, in India that you see, it, which is Tughlaqabad. And it's because I'll show you a close up of the bastions later. But this is the general area, like the property area and the buffer zone. And again, it's almost, it's a wildlife sanctuary. So it's, it's very well, could also be classified as a hill slope plus a forest fort, though the forest is not as dense as uh, Ranthambore. And you can see the property area again out here uh, and the mapping of the timeline and the structures. And these are the bastions. So this particular kind of bastion, it was just like in this fort and also in Tughlaqabad you find, which was actually constructed because it's very different to scale this bastion, you know, for soldiers who want to climb up. So it, it's got this very unique uh, style. And, and of course the loopholes that you see of different sizes across the stretch, you know, it, it has a periphery of about 30 plus kilometer where it, um, the circumference itself. And it is supposed to be the second or the third, uh, you know, largest wall. Some say like after uh, the Great Wall of China, Kumbhalgarh is supposed to be the biggest, or there is possibility that there is one in Iran. We, there is no, authentic source to that, but that's what is mentioned. It is second or third largest foot wall. Um, here you can see how it spreads. We had this image earlier, but you can also see why it was inscribed. Kumbhalgarh was constructed in a single process. You know, This is one like project mode foot where you design a foot. That's what Mandan did. And then you do complete it, you know, within a span of a, uh, less than a half a century. And Kumbhalgarh was constructed in a single process. And apart from the palace of Fateh Singh added later that you find on this extreme left on top, it retains its architectural coherence. Its design is attributed to an architect known by name Mandan, who was also an author and theorist at the court of Rana Kumbha and Chittorgarh. The combination of factors is highly exceptional. And it's really good to see UNESCO recognizing this I mean, not only Rana Kumbha, but also Mandan as the architect, which is which is so important for us, you know, to uh, get into the uh, into these uh, documents and recognition of uh, the craftspeople that were there or the Sutradhars. The next fort we for the Hill Valley fort we selected was Amer out of the lot that I showed you, and again, I mean, it is a very unique fort. 
this is uh, night time. I mean, they've uh, you know really developed it well for tourism because it also falls very well in the golden triangle of India. And the area that was selected, this is a smaller area. So it's really the Amir Palace and surroundings, which you see in red out here in the center, that is the property area. The green that you see in the surrounding is the buffer zone, which is actually the protected and reserved forest area. And the purple that you see is Jagad on top. Now Jagad was is owned by the Royal Foundation. Amir is owned by the State Archaeology Department. And the brown lot that you see here is the town, the Amir town. And this, the hills actually cover the entire city fortifications. So in this case, the property area was just this much, whereas the rest was in buffer. And this issue, I will explain why. I mean, it was again raised by ICOMOS because they wanted Jaeger to be part of it. And finally, when they visited uh, Jaipur in the advisory mission and they had a dialogue with the foundation, they realized that Jaeger doesn't want to be a property under UNESCO. And that's why, I mean, in the outstanding universal value and the attributes that we defined, it's Amir, which has the outstanding value, whereas Jaeger is a support that is there in the buffer. So you have, uh, this shows the historic plan of Amir Fort, and you can see it's from Susan Gold's book. And you can see, um, you know, the repairs and additions between 17th, uh, largely in the 17th century by Mirza Raja Jai Singh. So the first part on the left was made by uh, much earlier. And then later by Man Singh, uh, Raja Man Singh, who was also a commander for the Mughals. And then later on, uh, you know, this was expanded in the 17th century the other two courtyards that you see. And this would probably give you a better view, this aerial view, which you know I love to see it because I just feel that this is where I can see how a Rajput mind, you know, picked a Mughal uh, fort plan on the grounds and stretched it on the hill to expand, to make this. And you can see that this is the original uh, Mahal of Man Singh and how across the steps, you know, this has been planned with these gardens. So you can see the Mughal exchange out here and then courtyard. So the Diwane Yam and Diwane Khas and the whole Mughal planning comes here, but in a very indigenous Rajput manner, which is what is unique about this fort. And uh, that's why it is recognized because Amir Palace is really the one that has the outstanding value in this entire complex of, uh, with, with its surrounding fortification. It is representative of a key phase, 17th century, in the development of a common Rajput Mughal court style embodied in the buildings and gardens added to Amir by Mirza Raja Jaisi one. So that's what is its unique value, which is not there in the other forts. And uh, this, of course, is, uh, I'm not, uh, this is a bit off from the fortifications, but because we were talking about cannons, this is the second largest cannon in Asia, currently in Jagar, and Jagar also has a gun foundry. So in terms of military fortifications or the military um, uh, elements, if we are seeing, then Jagar, of course, has its own strength. And it, it's, if you see, this is a map created by a French researcher, Remy Papillon, where you see Jagger Fort, where the cannon is, and the cannon had a, you know, a distance of 80 kilometers for its reach. And you can see the circles, which are actually the cannon points. So initially, what would actually protect Amir, but later on when this cannon was there and Jaipur city is planned below on the plains, you can see how the cannon you know, reaches there till the end, till Sanganir, which is, it was only shot once, the cannon, and that is when the, the cannonball reached Sanganir, which is up, up, about 80 kilometers or so. Um, the Gagaran Fort was the hill water fort, which is again a unique uh, aspect in case of Rajasthan specifically, which is supposed to be a desert area. So here you find the confluence of two rivers. And we had these uh, um, uh, uh, researchers, Thought Studio from Chandigarh, who actually looked into the details of how the um, engagement with water and defense worked and how there were these small, uh, you know, um, gates which would actually go down to the river and which could be used as escape routes. So these are some detailed plans uh, that they worked on in terms of uh, the fortifications for a water fort like Gagaron. But Gagaron basically was, is recognized as an exemplar of a river protected fort. In addition to its strategic location in a pass in the hills, 
reflects its control of trade routes. So as such, it is a very small fort. You can see in the mapping also, uh, the property area is 23 hectares, which is really, you know, compared to the other forts, not much, but because it's inscribed, because of its unique um, location, important trade route, it served as a capital. It was attacked around 13 times, but couldn't be, you know, uh, you know, it was rarely conquered, so it could resist, uh, you know, a lot of attacks. And that's the reason it, it was included as one of the um, overall narrative. But again, I mean, this is one example I want to show you because this is a fort that may not qualify on its own. But when it's, you know, in the series and the attributes that we have mentioned, that's how it adds to the diversity of the physiographical terrain. And that's why we need to recognize what is different in a serial nomination vis-a-vis -vis individual site nomination, like Nagar or Mehrangar are forts which are really important. And maybe we can think, okay, you know, possibly they could uh, in future, you know, have some OUV on their own, but uh, there are some that could be part of series and that's where the strength is. Uh, Ranthambur, which is the hill forest fort. So here you can see, you know, the defense mechanism besides the forest that is there. You have these, uh, you know, uh, medieval period machulations. So you can actually, I mean, this is what would be used to throw big boulders down on the enemy or even, you know, like uh, the fire, um, uh, the uh, using the mashals, which is, you know, uh, throwing fire at your army. Uh, through these uh, holes and this these, this is the property and the buffer zone that you see out here really I mean in this case in most of the forts we found that buffer zone was really you know uh, not a worry because you have the entire national park as your buffer if you really want it so so they were we did give a buffer zone but uh, they are naturally protected so well that it's it's not such a worry except where you have settlements in the buffer zone so again, this is a similar mapping of uh, Ranthambore, but what I was mentioning, you know, this diagram by Noso again. So you have this Rana Kumbha's intervention where you see the gates and the kind of, you know, curves they take along the terrain. On left, you see an image of that, how you reach high up. So, I mean, in fact, the image gives you an idea of the steep slope that is there, um, though it seems a bit expanded in the drawing itself. But you can imagine the kind of uh, you know, difficulty anyone would have entering this fort and taking it over. What is unique about this fort, I mean, again, besides being a forest hill forest fort, it, is, it has this palace, which is uh, Hamir's palace. And situated in the middle of forest, Chanthambur is an established example of forest hill fort. And in addition, the remains of the palace of Hamir are among the oldest surviving structures of an Indian palace. And this was, uh, you know, verified by um, Dr. Giles Tillotson because he said, I mean, even during the Vijayanagara period, all the palace structures um, are all destroyed. So this is the earliest Hindu palace existing currently in India. And that is how, you know, was identified as its unique value. The- uh, Shita, yeah, yeah, time check, just, just a time check. Just uh, coming to the end now, five minutes. Do I have five minutes? Yes, yes. Okay. So Jaisalmer, the hill desert fort, um, you know, again, I mean, the areas that are mapped and here is where Munish helped us with the maps and filing in the nomination. But Jaisalmer is recognized as an example of a hill fort in the desert terrain. The extensive, extensive township contained within it from the outset still inhabited today. And the group of Jain temples makes it an important and in some respects, even unique example of a sacred and secular urban fort. So though urban settlement is an attribute in all the six forts, but this is where you see, you know, it's outstanding because you see those havelis and the inner fabric of the fort. Uh, my last point on management frameworks, it's very quick because just to show what the management framework is, they each function under, you know, their own jurisdiction. So th there are four which are predicted under ASI and two under state archaeology. So they follow the acts, but as a national, as, as a conservation policy, they adopt the national conservation policy of uh, ASI. And of course, they have additional protection in the buffer by the forest areas, except for few where, where they're looking at, you know, the city level, like in case of Jaisalmer, where they have to link to the master plan in the buffer zone. 
And quickly, some issues like in Chittorgarh, you know, you have a, a municipal ward. So the worry is that, you know, they, they are not allowed to construct anything, but there are houses rising up to cover the Shikhara. This is the museum interpretation that is created. And it also shows armory of uh, previous, uh, you know, times. Uh, the Pumbalgarh 4 main management issue, they, they have a very nice Bheel settlement, a tribal settlement in the middle of the fort, which is actually living harmoniously and actually, uh, you know, has agriculture, uh, it, you know, they, they do agriculture there inside and there is a lot of uh, produce of sitafal there. Um, but uh, right at the entrance of Kumbalgar, you also have this small settlement, which at times becomes a problem because they once had, you know, a house constructed right here near the Nilkan temple, which you see. And this was after negotiation, ASI actually moved these houses back to this particular area. So that remains a concern that, you know, there should be no expansion. Uh, the Jagor Fort on top, uh, like I said, it's under Jagor Foundation and then you have Amir Palace, but then it is part of the buffer zone management and Jagor Foundation is part of the management authority for the forts, the management uh, committee. And again, the town of uh, Amir requires bylaws. Uh, Ranthambore has some few families staying in, which is a concern in our forest fort. And of course they need to be uh, shifted and Jaisalmer, I think Munish can talk about the management issues because he <laughs> prepared the management plan. It's, it's a never ending concern, which is why the government restrained from initially placing it on the World Heritage List. But now with the management plan made, it's in the process of adoption um, and hopefully the things would be resolved. Uh, finally, to conclude, I think because, you know, these are forts, I mean, not just pro protected sites with the fortifications and the uh, structures, but they are living heritage. And that's why we need to look at managing them with the community or people living inside, like ASI had negotiated with one or two families inside the Kumbalgarh fort, which is a good example. So that house was actually here in Kumbalgarh and they moved it down. So basically this otherwise serve you know, nicely when the visitors come, you know, they also have some economy. There is a small tea shop. I mean, that's where your restaurant works. Uh, so one needs to just come, uh, you know, to a consensus on how these forts can still be living, but manage well without impacting the outstanding universal values or the attributes in any manner. So thank you very much for giving me this time. I'll stop sharing now. Yeah. Thank you, Shikha. That's a fabulous presentation. And uh, well, you asked for the uh, Jaisalmer management plan. Uh, very briefly, I'll just inform that uh, state government as well as Archaeological Survey of India, both had uh, a clear date. It had now gone to UNESCO. So uh, that's a relief now that things will fall in place uh, in the coming years. Uh, we do have questions, but we will keep it uh, after the last presentations, uh, which we are now going to have. And uh, this is by a fabulous person called Yash Pratap Singh Shekhawat. He is a conservation architect and uh, he has his own firm uh, with the name Tech Arc Studios. And uh, he has worked on several conservation projects in Punjab, Himachal, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan and uh, other states and uh, basically uh, interestingly he is also involved with uh, something called architectural travel guidebooks uh, for jaipur he has published it in 2018 and right now he's working on jodhpur jaisalmer and bikaner uh, he is quite an active member of nsc uh, uh, ecofort and uh, is pushing himself with all sorts of documentations of uh, private uh, uh, forts of in Rajasthan. It's a challenging job, and uh, he has taken up that with him. He is not going to talk about Sarwar Fort, and uh, Yash, I would. Uh, it's a quite a fabulous fort because first time I saw it, long long time back, and uh, I got an opportunity to document this particular fort in 2010. And uh, it's it's a fabulous fort, and uh, we are very eager to hear from you more about this particular fort. So, Yash, uh, floor is for you.
Yes, can you hear us? Yeah, now I think, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, please, the floor is yours. We are waiting for, for you. Okay, so uh, after the uh, presentation by uh, Reema ji and Shikha ji with fabulous forts of Rajasthan, actually my, the fort which I want to talk about is not as opulent as those ones, uh, but it's very significant because uh, it's not there on a very uh, popular tourist map and it's not known to many people. So therefore it, it's good to, uh, that we should actually put our point of focus to such kind of uh, foods because they then, you know, uh, help us to understand the gap between the, the, uh, the larger forts network. And they also help us in uh, understanding, you know, uh, the aspect of defense mechanism from a regional context rather than the uh, forts which always proved to be the capital uh, of kingdoms. So uh, since Sarwar is a very, uh, it's a very small town with a population of 20,000, not, not easily, uh, not people are not easily aware of the uh, location. So it's basically a part of Ajmer district and it is at the Hesel headquarter and uh, it's around uh, 61 kilometers from Ajmer and 73 kilometers from Kishinger, which is the closest towns for this and triple uh, one kilometers from Bundi as well. Uh, so the first thing which we need to look upon is the historical context. Uh, the historical context is very important to understand that why uh, such things are required. And uh, I've tried to map this dot in the yellow with a red boundary, which actually shows a location of Sarwar. And Sarwar is, uh, if I talk about like, because I've tried to uh, place these, uh, categorize these historical context with the uh, national context of Sultanate rule, then Mughals and then British Raj, because it is, it is where, there the people are most aware of the phrasing of history. And uh, what we see in Rajasthan, the, the beautiful aspect in Rajasthan is that uh, it's uh, the, the, moreover, the princely kingdoms which were prevalent in the beginning of the Sultanate period, which is in the 11th and 12th centuries, was actually consolidating itself towards the end of the 18th and 19th, 19th and 20th century. And uh, moreover, the boundaries remained same, except for that a little annexures were happening at the ed edge of their kingdoms. So Sarwar, interestingly, is actually on a junction of Dhundar, Mewar, Kishingar, as well as Ajmer, Mewar region. And it has remained and a little away from the Haroti region, which is the Bundi kingdom. And, uh, but it, it's basically a kind of a junction which required a defense mechanism. Uh, and therefore it is very important to have a very good defense mechanism for such a kind of a fort. Uh, historically, uh, there are a few maps which have uh, also mentioned this place since it's, a, it's not a well-documented place. Uh, uh, not even have much more well-documented records about this place, which I'm not aware of probably. Uh, Munish, because he has worked on this, he must be aware of some. Uh, so I found uh, the my mention of this name, Sarwar, on the uh, Ifam Habib's address uh, of Mughal Empire. And also in the uh, later map, which is of the Gazetteer, Imperial Gazetteer in 1909, it also shows the position of Sarwar, which is right in between the Ajmer Mehrwara's two segment. One was Kekri and one was the Ajmer uh, itself, the, the main part of it. But it was a narrow piece of land which was actually in between the two parts, which was splitting the Ajmer uh, Mirwada uh, political boundaries into two halves. Well, uh, the coming down from a regional context to a local context, there have been textual references which say that Farwar was actually started 2000 years back by God dynasty. And uh, Bachraj God is said to have actually started the Sarwar Fort, but there is no tangible remains which is still you know predates this time. Uh, whereas because the fort here is a little different than what would have been 2000 years ago, but yes, this is one reference which can be again subject to archaeological excavations and findings later on. There have been some Islamic invasions in old Adinan Jain Temple, which is there in this part of the uh, uh, region and uh, which have been attacked by Muhammad Ghori in Qutubdin Abak. 
Another interesting thing is that the son of Khwaja Garib Nawaz, which is which based in the uh, Ajmer, his son has actually uh, died uh, in Sarwar, and his shrine is known as Sarwar Shri, which is being visited by uh, pilgrims who go to Ajmer. So there's a there's a local uh, pilgrimage route which prevails here, wherein a person uh, who visits the shrine of uh, Ajmer Sharif has to the second thing he has to do is to go to the shrine of Sharbar Sharif. That's kind of a kind of a trail which has been created over a period of time. Uh, so till then, Ajmer was definitely a part of, uh, you know, was a, a definitely a part of Ajmer. But uh, it is, there's a mention of that uh, Kishangad, uh, Raj Singh of Kishangad, uh, who apparently helped the Bahadur one in the uh, war of succession after Rodan Zeb. Uh, he eventually uh, won the war and uh, Jai Singh II, who actually uh, helped the uh, eldest son, uh, lost the war. So because of his uh, loyalty to the then emperor of India, he granted the Jagir of uh, uh, Sarwar and Malpura to uh, Raj Singh. And it then became the part of the smallest principality of Rajasthan. Uh, apparently, uh, uh, the gota making uh, industry in Sarwar, uh, you know, it still works. And every household, most of the household in Sarwar are actually doing the process of gota making there. Uh, which also tells us that there were some kind of trade links between Ajmer and uh, Marwa. And uh, it is believed that gota was also one of the commodity being traded in these parts. There, there is, there are some references which say that it, it was connected to Barhanpur, which had the textile industry, uh, industrial heritage available there. And it, it, there was some link between uh, the gota making uh, in Sarwar to the, that place. Now, uh, talking about the principality of Kishingar, there are various ports which dot the map of Kishingar. Uh, the largest one being, yes, the princely capital uh, Kishingar itself. But the other forts were Karkeli, Rupangad, Aran, Dasuk, Patagar. Uh, so in the Indian Kishangad, like what the presentation we have seen in Shikha, uh, Jen's presentation, the Ajmer and Kishangad are actually on the Aravli range. And the ones, Rupangad and Karkeli are also the hill forts because they are on the, uh, the, the part which is on the north of Aravlis and they are some ranges of Aravli which goes there as well. Whereas the uh, forts in the lower part of uh, Kishangad are actually planar forts which are available on the plains. They might be rock outcrops in the, at the plain level, which is available for them to build forts, but that's how it has been. Uh, so some of the popularly known forts, uh, the most outstanding one, which I believe among all these forts was Sarwar, and that is why I've taken this up for a presentation because it's, it's, a, it's a one which I found with very uh, extensive mechanism for defense and uh, and we have about tried already establishing the reason that why defense was required because it was a junction of various princely uh, capital uh, kingdoms. So yeah, uh, understanding the concept of the settlement and the uh, port itself, how it sits. So it's, it's because it's not an imperial, uh, sorry, it's not a princely capital city. So therefore the port is outside the uh, city itself, but the city itself is fortified. So the, uh, it's not a city, it's like a town. And the town itself is fortified. So there are fortification walls which is visible in the town itself. And there are entrance gates which I've shown in the earlier slides. And the fort, the fort is actually outside the town. Uh, this is an accentuated, exaggerated uh, terrain level. It's a three times exaggeration, not that much of terrain level difference is there. But the settlement also chooses a little higher platform to settle down. And the fort also chooses a little higher platform. There's a gap in between. And that's, that's this is this is the higher platform, the highest platform of the settlement is occupied by the shrine of uh, Khwaja Fakhruddin, which is the son of Khwaja Karim Nawaz of Ajmer. So it's, uh, if I want to actually do some kind of, you know, uh, status evaluation of the fort, then it's actually a garrison fort because I don't see, uh, it has never been a capital of any of the kingdoms. And uh, it doesn't have that that kind of an opulence as well, but it has very good defense mechanism, and that satisfies that it is a garrison fort. Uh, there are three rings of fortification, and I have classified them as innermost fortification, central fortification, and outer fortification. Uh, the the largest outer fortification, if I actually use only the bastions and not the moat as the boundary, 
then it is acquires almost 10 acres of land and it encompasses the innermost fortification and the central fortification as well uh it this was under the tehsil administration earlier but it was in 2009 there was some local reference which said that the, the district collector of ajmer actually granted it to the uh, transferred it to the custody of uh, tourism department and henceforth it is being maintained by there a uh, state of conservation uh, uh, there have been attempts in 2018-19 to you know some parts of it which I, which can be seen in the further presentation uh, but uh, most of the fort is actually in ruins and the best part is that at least the fort wall are still intact and that therefore the interpretation of the fort as one of the most important fort to understand uh, fortification systems uh, is there uh, i don't have a very clear cut historical demarcation when was this fort started but uh, there the kind of structure which i see here and the kind of references i found in built uh, in the textual references it is assumed that the initiation of this fort has happened in the uh, you know uh, sultanate period which was during the 12th and the 13th centuries uh, accessibility as it was earlier open to all and anybody could plunder it anybody could actually take off any material from the fort uh, although it's uh, nothing uh, precious is left over there now there but uh, again it is it is subjected to vandalism so after the restoration works has been carried out it was locked up for people to uh, you know not to access it uh, by the concerned uh, authority and uh, this particular presentation is based out of a photographic documentation which i which i did first and when i when i explored this post fort uh, uh, during my education at spa and uh, that and since it actually touched me upon at that point of time and it's a very important platform for such kind of forts to be uh, to get recognition uh, and uh, some kind of support from the fraternity so that documentation can happen and so that uh, further uh, data can be collected for this these kind of forts which are important but uh, if, uh, neglected because of certain reasons uh, to start with then uh, i took actually images of various uh, a time periods available on google earth and uh, found out that the because the first few images of 2019 doesn't show the moat level very clearly but there are very clear cut three rings of fortification and a double moat system which is very unique in rajasthan because i don't see many forts have double ring of moat uh, available in them uh, not even the larger ones which are proved to be a capital uh, fort for a lot of Uh, larger kingdoms uh, than this kind of a kingdom uh now it's essentially a land fort so uh, i if i compare the land fort available in rajasthan at various different scales so i took one as junagadh which was one of the largest uh, principal uh, principality or largest princely kingdom of rajasthan and uh, it is also a land fort with with very regular uh, geometry of rectangle which is seen in sarwar and uh, the kind of same kind of defense mechanism of double uh, layered uh, moat i will show you in the next slides with how the double ramparts are happening which is also seen in nagore as well but the the geometry is very strikingly similar of the sarwar with the kaner and junagadh uh, and that's the scale i'm trying to compare with uh, the another and it's a it's a land again a land fort on a very flat terrain rather than a, a hilly slope and in fact in bikaner it is not the highest elevation of the settlement as well because it's a desert uh, fort uh, the water from the settlement of the surface runoff of the settlement of bikaner or the uh, city of bikaner used to run into the moat of the fort as well so that that's a kind of a setup which has that the the access water which is falling on the surface and the, the soil of bikaner is such that Uh, it doesn't uh, let the water percolate inside it only supports surface runoff uh, because it has like what we call in rajasthani as magra kind of a soil formation which is sort calcified sand uh, it's kind of a sand which is uh, because of the carbonation effect and it and the calcium when built into it uh, it has become a rock hard kind of a surface uh, and it doesn't permit water to percolate inside so that kind of a terrain has been utilized by this uh, fort to actually get water to the moat whereas in sarwar uh, which i have tried to show in the earlier map there are a lot of water bodies along with it there is a river which flows and there are there is water available for its moat to fill 
but still i don't have still don't have the answer why there was a double mode system yes probably because of the defense system required in this but it was not an imperial not not a capital fort not it was housing uh, the princes or the kings of any of the principalities but yet it has a double mode uh, double uh, mode fortification system which i don't know why it, it was very you know it was there uh, the third fort which i have tried is actually a fort of a tikana which is in the same principality of kishingarh it's uh, almost 6 7 kilometers uh, from the marble mandi of kishingarh and uh, it also follows a very same geometry with a sent uh, with a with a fortification uh, and bastions uh, along the corners and the centers of the wall uh, which is uh, and the access is like this it is also uh, built on a plain flat terrain and uh, doesn't have an elevation to support its defense mechanism that's the entry gate to the fort uh, so and and i've tried to place them into three scales of their own and i've tried to identify where to place sarwar uh in terms of its uh, uniqueness in terms of its importance and significance uh while i was comparing with smaller forts which hold lesser importance and so what the only difference between all these three forts is this this fort is a residential fort for a uh, tikanada this fort is a residential fort for a king for a uh, maharaja of the principality or the prince uh, or the uh, principal uh, princely kingdoms but this fort doesn't have those kind of evidences that it was actually the residential fort of for any of those kings and queens although in later period when it was under kishingarh there are uh, examples of some habitation palace created in this in a most ruined uh, there so i have there's this beautiful aerial view which has i've tried to uh, take it take it from youtube and it shows actually the essence of this fort so uh, three rings of fortification double moat one is in the in the central fortification one is there it has double rampart so one was on the top another rampart which goes along with it which is very quite similar to what we see in bikane what we see in nagor uh, which i can actually try to relate that the fortification wall appearance wise it looks more like the forts which have been built in those times uh, then uh, the central most is the highest elevated platform which has a palace kind of a single storied structure which is considered as a palace for the fort um, over there these some past conservation works are actually seen on the gateway uh, like the uh, typical work like a tourism department with uh, plaster walls and yellow uh, kali work done and some kind of red sand stone paved surfaces the gate this gate has been restored and this uh, this is the gate which is uh, also is stored in the same gate to access to the central uh, fortification so the in, the most interesting thing is apart from its uh, intricate uh, defense systems which has like so many of walls and everything yet the uh, entrance to this fort is very directly you know you, you actually come inside you just take a little left and then you have an access to the uh, inner in our central fortification and then the inner fortification which uh, takes you to the topmost level is also directly in the same direction this is actually not direction probably it is because of vastu but uh, this show that you know the defense was important but yet they did not wanted to dodge the enemies directly also so that that means that there is some kind of complication in fort which we need to uh, more research for uh, clarifying uh, further yeah so the i'll take you to a photo gallery which shows various components of the fort because it's, it's important to see them visually as well so this is how the uh, the entrance gate is actually protected between two large two bench bastions and uh, it's, it's it's a very hideous kind of a uh, uh, access way to for a gate uh, with moats uh, along the uh, outer edge of the uh, fortification and then you have a bridge to access the gateway and this is the entrance gateway uh, so you have two rings of uh, merlins uh, which is prominently in the plaster and then you have another wall and the uh, another wall on top of it there are a lot of holes inside uh, the loop holes inside these walls of this is uh, the size of the whole loop was there that it was also used for uh, uh, guns uh, as a defense mechanism apart from cannons so probably maybe a later period it had a layer has been added on the this wall 
uh, another interesting thing is which I, if i compare to another forts where the gates are protected from top it is it doesn't seem in this case because the gates doesn't have those mechanisms where you know anybody who's striking your gate can be dodged off uh, is primarily because i see so I show you showed you in the earlier presentation that actually it's directly opposite to these bastions and it's very uh, it's it's hidden between these two bastions so it's it's already protected from these two bastions and uh, this is one thing which i observed in that fort uh this is the second uh, ring of fortification uh the central one and uh, it also has a moat inside uh, along with the wall there are there's a rampart on the edge of this moat and then another rampart on the top of the wall uh this is the entrance gateway to the second one so the first uh, ring of fortification has a entrance gateway which takes you to a, a 90 degree angle but this uh, gateway leads you directly inside the surface so it's like you know the second ring but uh, easily accessible for anybody in reading this fort uh, another interesting thing is that uh, in these two rings of fortification there uh, I'll probably explain it much later but there there are some access to this particular part below the rampart which is also accessible uh, which also has access to people to run inside and with some kind of opening loopholes outside the wall where they can actually see from two levels of protection of this wall can happen. Uh, interestingly, another thing is that uh, between the wall and the chambers, with the habitable spaces which are there, like the rooms and the chambers which are there, it's earth filled up in between. So uh, this could probably be because of to for it to actually take an impact of the cannon attacks because cannons uh, will uh, you know uh, damage the wall, but then it doesn't actually provide the entry directly to the inside the fort. There is, there is a lot of earth which is also need to be dug out for them to enter inside the fort. Uh, yeah, so this is the kind of. The kind of tunnels which actually goes across and these tunnels provide the base for the ramparts on top uh, which you see over here and it's accessed inside so a person actually a person doesn't have so much of size that except the person can access it but it does it still has that access to inside the uh, wall uh, i don't know there's somebody who's doing yeah so the uh, I was trying to understand how these fortification walls uh, uh, work, and I, it was very really interesting that you know, uh, although I showed you a section which was a little exaggerated earlier in the uh, settlement morphology, but these the place has uh, level differences, altitude differences, but not so high. So first process is always about the selection of the site, where you actually select the site and uh, the surface which has to be there. You start digging it for creation of the moats, and then uh, retaining walls needs to be created for so that the moat moats can be uh, created. Uh, then the 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 earth dug from the moat itself has actually served as the backing for this particular wall. So the, after the retaining walls are constructed, the uh, earth is actually backed up, and another retaining wall fills the earth. So it's now the effective length of fortification is between this wall. Uh, sorry this wall and this wall so it's it's, it's a double leaf wall but in the, the the thickness of the earth actually makes it more protective uh, once the uh, the earthing is done uh, then you have spaces which you can which can be accessed from this side of the fort the living spaces so you have a tunnel which goes along the wall then you have a rampart on top of it with, with these with the defense mechanism the wall available and you have a moat the same kind of feature was there in the two rings of fortifications there. Uh, yeah, so the central ring of fortification, this is the access, the, the uh, view from the access gate. This is the outer access gate uh, and the inner central uh, fortification wall access gates. And see, we can see this tunnel which goes all along the wall from uh, complete end to end. So this is the innermost part of uh, the fort, which is the highest altitude platform. The, this is the this is the baseline and the the uh, upper level actually lies on this level so this is all completely filled with earth uh, and the palace which has few rooms there it sits on top of this fort these uh, openings are very distinctive of kishingarh uh, symbolically it represents kishingarh because the similar kind of openings and the shape profile of openings are found in kishingarh fort as well 
uh, which is very unique to this place, and you don't see this kind of this kind of a marking of Kishinger Principality on this. Probably, and it, it it's very evident from this that the this particular part has been added later after these uh, Merlins have been disturbed, and this 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 doesn't belong to the actual period of this fort, uh, which is possibly the later addition of uh, the Kishinger rulers then. Uh, this is the access to the innermost part. Uh, you actually enter inside a staircase, which takes you, which is a very narrow passageway, and takes you to a dark tunnel, which is access, uh, which has some lit lighting, uh, daylighting happening uh, from the ventilators. Uh, and then, after walking around 30, 40 meters, you actually get onto the uh, upper structure. The defense mechanism of the taller, the, the central structure has uh, uh, remains which show that there were cannons on the corner bastions. There were a lot of uh, loopholes inside and uh, these loopholes are actually larger in number. So uh, this is possibly like what Shikajan presented in the earlier that it's maybe too confused, but the size of these openings suggests that actually they were, it was also meant for guns to be used. Uh, this is the palace which sits on the top. Uh, there, there are water bodies available in all parts of port uh, and grain trees to store grains and every level of the port there are these two sources of food and, and water available. Uh, some One of the bastion has been later converted into a residential room for the then rulers uh, of Kishinger. Uh, and this is what my presentation is. So this last slide shows you the innermost, the central, the outer ring and then you have Sarwar settlement, which is also a little, little raised platform where you see some symbols of uh, the Shabar Sharif gateway. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yash, for the fabulous presentation and uh, reminded us uh, what happened 10 years back at this fort. And uh, well, yes, that was the time when tourism department was take over this particular fort from the government and uh, wanted to develop it for a, as a tourist attraction, but somehow perhaps the policies didn't work further. And uh, I think now uh, this is the time for us to take up the question. So may I request all the presenters to switch on their uh, mics and uh, videos so that we can start taking questions. Rima ji, yeah, she's here. Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, well, uh, we start with Rima ji. Uh, there is a question from uh, Abhijit. He wants to ask you, are there any modifications of existing medieval style fort in the style of European uh, star fort or vacuban forts? Okay. Oh. To the best of my knowledge, no, there are no modifications that I offer. There are some late 18th century forts like Lakshmangar, which might be worth looking at from this point of view. I, you know, the last time I saw it, I wasn't thinking of it in this way. Maybe Shikha would like to come in also. But as I said, to the best of my knowledge, no. Yeah. Uh... So I think uh, he's uh, talking, the question was about Warburn Forts, which is a French- Warburn Forts, yeah. Designer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we got it, the Star Forts. Yeah, so in Rajasthan, there is no such influence of Warburn Forts, but yeah, in other areas in India, like in Punjab and Chennai, you find a very uh, strong, uh, you know, uh, following there with the Bahadurgarh Fort that was shown yesterday by, uh, Mrs. Amita Beg and even Govindgarh on and Govindgar, yes. Fort George in Chennai. So there are there are some forts you know that took on, but the Rajasthan forts uh, definitely no, don't have. There are I mean in some cases you know the British period when uh, there was an exchange between the Rajput royals mm -hmm. and they acquired the new guns and pistols and you know so there you see modifications in the loopholes in each fort because then they you know tried uh, so it was basically for the guns that they modified so you see those minor modifications but, but it's an varying yeah but it's still an interesting because Du Bois a lot of people 
uh, because of the Marathas and the Mughals using Shekhawati area of Rajasthan as a passing, you know, passage and a battlefield might be worth looking at some of the very tiny uh, and, and seeing that. But as I said, to the best of my knowledge, staff ports were broken. No. And Wabun okay. is, yeah. you know, the Wabun forts in France are actually also a serial nomination uh, mm -hmm. inscribed on their list. I see. Uh, the next question is for Shikha. Does the settlement the settlement in Jaisalmer fort include the world heritage? <laughs> I think that question can be answered by you also. Muni. <laughs> yeah, the settlement, I mean, that is the challenge in Jaisalmer because the recognition is of the urban living heritage, you know, the, the historic mm -hmm. houses and the havelis and, you know, the whole fort planning with the settlement is what is outstanding. So that is the challenge in management now, how we, you know, balance that. Uh, they definitely they can't grow in there because the outstanding universal value can be impacted. So maybe they would have some other arrangement. And I think Monish can add to that, you know, as the management uh, person for that. I, I believe that that was the thing that being as a living fort is its USP uh, or uh, OUV uh, in, in a larger perspective. So yes, this uh, settlement within the fort, yes, that's a part of the world heritage. Uh, well, the other question for you, Shikha, is from uh, Poonam, and she wants to ask uh, uh, regarding Kumbhalgar, uh, you know, the issue of design of buildings that come up with uh, with the hotels or homes uh, next to the uh, these forts. Hmm. Yeah. Are there any guidelines for it? Or that's what I think I believe yeah, she yeah, wants to yeah. know. I mean, Kumbhalgar is, is, of course, the uh, area is a concern, but that's the kind of guidelines we need uh, in all the fort areas, you know, on all the areas around the fort, whether it's Ame town, Jaisalmer, of course, has its own guidelines, which is good, the town itself. Uh, but Kumbhalgar, because it is a, a forest, like sanctuary area, uh, but in terms of design guidelines, currently, I agree that, you know, they are all kinds the vocabulary of the heritage hotels that come up and they use various styles whatever suits them mm -hmm. so, so definitely that is a point uh, we should take care of uh, yeah. though i mean we have to see in the buffer zone how much uh, mandate is there you know uh, to do these kind of guidelines but i completely agree that they are required well and the next question is by shi yun chang uh, and the question is, where the materials like stones come for, from the building, uh, these fortresses or fortifications? Are there many queries in Rajput kingdom? I'm sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not able to pronounce the name, but that's a very yeah. interesting question and close to my heart. Of course, there are Rajasthan is an area rich in stone both in limestone and sandstone and marble, you know, these three kinds of stone. And there are, you know, number of quarries, even the Makrana marble quarry of which Taj is made of, you know, or the Lutyans Delhi uh, later on. So, I mean, it's not only in Rajasthan itself, but the, all the earlier capitals or imperial uh, rules that, rulers that were there, they used the Rajasthan quarries and they used the Rajasthan craftspeople. And I mean, we've recently, you know, taken a study on the stone craft itself, and there is so much variation. Jaisalmer is a yellow stone, which is a soft stone, the kind of carving it can give. And it has, I mean, there are various quarries, and at different periods of time, these quarries were, you know, one would finish and they'll move on to the next. But now the Rajasthan government has very consciously looked at stone crafts. We ourselves like mapped around 13 quarries across, you know, various uh, areas in Rajasthan, both sandstone, marble, and limestone, and looked at the crafts. Uh, uh, stone crafts, how it can be promoted. And they are still helping in conserving, you know. We still use a lot of stone, uh, both in conservation and also in new construction because of the range that we have. Uh, next question is from Archana. Uh, she wants to know why Nahargad was included in the Amir's uh, buffer zone with Jagar. 
so Archana, if we if we look at the mapping, uh, Nahargarh is not really uh, protecting or has any link direct link with the outstanding value of Amir as such. It was Jagar, you know. Of course, Rima can add to my thing. Uh, but now Nahargarh is a very important buffer zone for Jaipur city because it overlooks the Jaipur city and it was a defense mechanism used for that. So in, in case of Amir, the town itself and the walled uh, area around the town did not uh, need to include that. Uh, Rima, would you like to add to that? Yeah, Rima. Well, just that Nahargarh is more important once Jaising makes Jaipur. And he also makes sure that part of the surface is dressed and that is used to make, you know that also, to make the city of Jaipur. So now he's more directly linked with Jaipur and less with Amir. There's, there's a paper of the four, uh, in, I think a seminar, I'll put that on the link somewhere. I've done a paper on the little forts around also, but it covers Nahargad and Jaigar. I see, that's great. Uh, another question is, uh, are the private forts of Rajasthan are accessible to public or are they restricted? Uh, I think Jayant has asked this question. So uh, I think all of us can answer even Yash who's <laughs> dealing with a private fort. <laughs> Maybe Yash can answer. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, if I categorize the private forts into uh, there are different categories. So, one is which is under the trust or the family trust. They are accessible, they are dedicated, and most of them are actually making it accessible. Uh, some of the private forts are being converted to heritage hotels, like Rima ji also mentioned in that uh, answer she was giving the chat box. Uh, that that is open to the guests and people. The the third one, which is the largest category of forts, uh, is is still lying derelict because of multiple ownerships and the disputes between the family members. Uh, those ports are still, you know, they, they, are, they are not accessible to people because people feel threatened who are living there. And uh, this is one thing which is a challenge for me also because we are trying to deal with such ports, trying to develop some kind of revenue earning mechanism for them. It's, it's really difficult for us to deal with those kind of ports. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, there is another question for you uh, from Poonam, and she wants to know about uh, why we are not talking about the mints and the uh, treasuries of these forts, and whether they have a similar kind of a coins or uh, there was some kind of, you know, common currency for them to trade. Uh, oh. Also, she wants to know about the armament factories and of these forts are quite, uh, you know, the similarities between that. Yeah, so uh, um, it's a little difficult question for me because uh, the lack of uh, records available for this board, I cannot say whether it has its separate mint, uh, but it was mm -hmm. part of a larger uh, network and uh, definitely one such possibility for this board was that it was protecting a trade route between Ajmer and uh, Malwa. And that is, and another thing was that because it was on a junction of various kingdoms, uh, this became a very important fortification center. Uh, that is what I'm aware of. Uh, uh, and uh, about the mint with Kishingar, uh, uh, that I'm not really sure whether they had a separate mint for themselves. Because they were the smallest principality uh, and always struggled with uh, revenues for themselves. They were close to Mughals. And that is how they enjoyed some of the benefits. And that is why the smallest principality, irrespective of its neighbors being uh, Marwar and Bhundar, they still survived. It was only because they had relations with Mughals. Uh, that's it. Okay, another one for you again. <laughs> uh, this is by Kiran Joshi. Uh, she wanted to know, do you have any information about the construction system used for the outer walls or the gates? Uh, so there is, again, this, this port doesn't have much recorded evidence, but it mm -hmm. is something that we can actually understand and evaluate the systems after observing it and documenting it. Uh, fortunately, unfortunately, I have not been able to have detailed, do detailed drawings of it. Maybe uh, Mish will have it so I can probably get yeah, that. Yeah, sure. Right? <laughs> but uh, uh, I, was, I was just trying to make an attempt to understand how these systems work. 
the most significant aspect which attracted from you know me towards this sport was the double moat system which i actually did not found in various uh, significant forts of rajasthan uh the land forts not the hill fort because they already had a defense mechanism of uh, defense uh yet that is why I, i actually wanted to bring up this fort in this platform but uh, the sketch schematic sections which i was trying to show how these outer fortification is basically my understanding of the outer walls fortification systems how they develop uh i'm not a expert on uh, the loopholes the type of loopholes used for various defense mechanisms probably i'll have to get back to the experts on that and then i can uh, talk to you about uh, how these whether the loopholes were actually meant for arrows or for guns or for uh, possibly for other kind of defense mechanisms uh shikha there is another question for you this is by tejas and uh, the question is whether there is any comprehensive work on water management system of forts in rajasthan well uh, not on all forts of rajasthan i think that needs to be taken up for each fort because each fort had its unique mechanism you know like i mentioned about chitorgarh in a similar manner kumbalgarh had its own uh, uh, water systems uh, what is interesting is on these in all these forts is you have this ganga kund you know which would be yeah. like a sacred spot would be a spring that comes out which would be probably the origin of the base what you know the first water body and then it gets into a network of catchment areas and uh, linked water body but that's where you get the ground water um i think there is uh, one fort that has you know really done a good uh, documentation of water systems and that is jagar so probably reema can talk about that because they actually have a water walk you know on the water management system a special walk in jagar so if you want to say something about that okay so water even for amer they've now worked on getting the old uh, water lifting system done we've also got a lot more research on how water was lifted from shikar talked about the old city of amer so from i'm not calling town but you can call it a town so from old amer water was lifted both up to jagar physically using uh, a field danda or an elephant walk and women, humans carrying it but also through partly through a, a mecha, semi mechanized system the other thing she talked about is how water was collected off the slopes of of just above jagar and then channeled to this enormous uh, semi underground taka water tank at jagar and that is uh, unique in its self so yes there is a lot of uh, water related work that has gone on mostly single papers not one comprehensive book but was it rajasthan water is crucial i think even dr bhadani has written on uh, water to do with rajasthan and there is a phd engineer sk mishra who has dropped off my radar in the last few years we used to go around and talk about the different jhalras you know things to do with urban areas not just the rural areas so yes water is important water has been worked on maybe it's something we want to look at in the future forts and water works water systems something like that uh, so munish uh, just to yeah. add to this because i recall jaisalmer we had documented mm-hmm. the water system as part of the infrastructure and the seven wells yeah. inside the you know whole thing they are completely blocked and so we they have ground water so that was not yes. a management issue you know that of course from there like getting the water up was done by bishtis from the gadia sar lake uh, but now you know with the water tanks coming up on jaisalmer fort they just stopped using those seven wells so the traditional yeah. definitely need to be looked at yeah that is uh, in fact uh, in several other forts also like as you said that in perpetually in every fort they had a natural water source ground water uh, which was whether it's a spring or a well which was there because uh, you know considering that in during the time of sage they don't have an access to go out for months so they were very heavily relied upon the internal sources and uh, yes uh, you know uh, the forts even which are private forts like kuchaman it had an elaborate rainwater harvesting system and perpetually like every drop of uh, rain which is falling within the premises of the fort was collected uh, in different layers of tanks 
so uh, i think this is something which because the scarcity of water in general in, in rajasthan uh, a, a lot of importance was given to water management on and water harvesting uh, uh, Munish, yeah. if i can add monish yeah uh, both at jagar amer and many other forts such stone mm-hmm. that quarry always became a water collection system you know uh, because it was sure rock so there would yes. be some sand or some soil at the bottom and it becomes a, a place from which you can draw water even at gagron yeah that's that's what the you know indigenous uh, tradition knowledge system is they they were using every uh, bit of their effort and multiplying it uh, with uh, its multiple utility so it was not that a query remains a query only so uh, well uh, if i ask uh, priyanka uh, I, i believe i have all question uh, raised and if i missed anything priyanka please uh, let me know if there is any question i missed and um, well uh, i believe uh, sorry yeah i think you've taken most of them i don't think we've missed out any Okay. I think if uh, since Pune has come back, Manish, since Pune has yeah. come back, we turn on uh, mint. Can I say something from the historical perspective, if I can still be heard? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, mm-hmm. uh, uh, at an earlier, forts like Chittor, your voice, so they have their own mix. Mm-hmm. Usually, copper coins, some silver coins, is breaking up. Uh, maybe i can just put that in in our chat box later on can you, if you can hear me earlier there were yeah, yeah, mints yeah, at some of the forts not at all forts some of the cities but post uh, during the mughal period and particularly around the time of uh, uh, mohammad shah rangila they actually needed to give out a grant to have a mint at a particular city even for something as in, independent as mewar mewar gets a grant to have a mint and so they can have three types of coins two of which are done indigenously not in a fort but otherwise so there is a whole issue there which there's so many issues that we can take up aspects of forts okay that's great uh well i think we should uh, it's a time for us to uh, close this particular session and uh, thank you very much to all the presenters and uh, i sh- i'm sure we had a lots of audience and i can see uh, quite a bit uh, of people uh, listening to this particular uh, webinar uh, of today's and uh, thank you everyone and thank you icomos india and as uh, ecofort and uh, we should close this session thank you jayan uh, yash uh, shikha rima thank, thank you everyone and we have the last session on july 4th Yeah. Yes. That's the concluding. And thank you, thank you to all uh, the other people who were at the back end uh, and kept their, uh, you know, videos and mics off, uh, and were supporting me from all perspectives because of my limited knowledge of <laughs> these technologies. Thank Thanks. you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Bye. Yeah.